first of all, um, notice the basic thing that needs explaining, which is that we all start life as a collection of embryonic blastomeres. And these, this, this is a cross section through a human torso. So this is what, uh, what each of us has inside. Now look at all the, in, the incredibly complex and variant order, all the, all the tissues and structures, everything is in the right place next to each other, the right orientation, size, and so on. So the first question is, where is the shape encoded? How do, how, how do these cells know to make exactly this? And you might be tempted to say DNA and, and genomes, but we can read genomes now. And what we see is that genomes directly code for protein structure. So the genome specifies the micro level hardware that's present in every cell. But uh, there's nothing directly that you can read out in the genome about the symmetry type of the organism, the size, the shape, how regenerative it's going to be. Um, this is very much an open problem of how cells know what to what to make and when to stop. Uh, as workers in regenerative medicine, if parts of this are missing, we'd like to know how to signal the cells to rebuild, to do it again. And as engineers, we'd like to know, well, what else is possible, right? Given the exact same genome, what else can we ask these cells to do? Or is this the only thing they could possibly do? And you can, you can sort of uh, visualize forward the end game of this whole field is something like this. It would be an anatomical compiler where you should be able to sit down and draw at the level of anatomy, the animal or plant that you want, okay, not, not, the, not the pathways, not genes, but, but the actual anatomy. And uh, if we knew what we were doing, we would have a system that, um, deco that, that compiled that description into a set of stimuli that would have to be given to cells to get them to build this particular thing, in, in this case, a nice three-headed uh, planarian. Now, we don't have anything remotely like this. This is a very long, uh, long-term goal. And the reason that uh, it's really important is because if you think about it, um, pretty much every problem of biomedicine with the exception of infectious disease. So birth defects, uh, tra traumatic injury, cancer, aging, degenerative disease, all of these things boil down to one problem. How do you convince cells to build the exact structure that you want? If we solve that problem, all of this goes away. We'd be able to fix birth defects, regenerate limbs, reprogram tumors, all of this would, would, would go away. But it's a major, major problem. Why do we not have a, an anatomical compiler yet? So I want to be clear that um, despite the incredible progress in uh, genetics and molecular biology, we face very fundamental questions that have to do with not, not with the molecular mechanisms, but with the decision making. So here's a simple example. Um, here is, this is a baby axolotl. So axolotls are Mexican salamander. There's a baby axolotl and um, baby axolotls have legs. Here's a tadpole of the frog Xenopus lavis. Tadpoles do not have legs. So now in my group, we make something called a frog -lotl. So this is a half, this, uh, it's a chimera, half uh, axolotl, half frog. You can mix the, the cells. They, they cooperate with each other just fine. They make something, a frog -lotl. Now I ask a simple question. You've got the genome to the axolotl. You've got the genome to the frog. How come we don't have any models that tell us whether frog -lotls will have legs? We have no idea from, from that information whether frog -lotls are going to have legs or not. And if they do have legs, whether those legs will be made of axolotl cells or also include frog cells. We, we, we have no idea, even though you've got the genetic information. So it's really important to start to understand the algorithms because where, um, where biomedicine is right now is that uh, we're very good at manipulating molecules and cells and getting information like this, which, uh, which gene and protein talk to which other uh, gene and protein. We are a long way away from actually controlling a large scale form and function. And in fact, you, you can think about the, the kind of parallel journey that uh, the computer science took. This is what programming looked like in the 40s and 50s, where in order to control the system, you had to physically rewire it, right? You were pulling wires in and out, you had to rewire it. Nowadays, uh, for a joke, I say to all my students, you know, you're on your laptop, you're going to go from, from uh, Microsoft Word to Photoshop, I want you to get out your soldering iron and start rewiring, you know, start rewiring. And of course, they all laugh because, because nowadays, we don't need to do that. We understand that if your hardware is good enough, it's reprogrammable with stimuli, with inputs, with experiences, not rewiring. But of course, modern molecular medicine is all about the hardware. We're all, we're all very excited about genomic editing and protein pathways and single molecule approaches. And so I think the reason that we are still roughly where computer science was in the, in the 50s is because we are, we've been neglecting one important um, aspect, and that is uh, multi-scale intelligence in biology. Now, what do I mean by intelligence? I mean uh, what William James meant, which is the ability to reach the same goal by different means. And when, uh, when we talk about a, a pattern and anatomy, when I talk about goals, I mean regions of morphous space. Now, what's morphous space? Morphous space uh, is the, uh, the space of all possible configurations of some particular structure. So if you're looking at uh, snail shells, for example, there are three parameters that you can define. And 
uh, every shell is every every possible snail shell is some point within this morphous space. Okay, and this is this is uh, an idea that's very that's very old. In fact, Darcy Thompson in the '40s had this interesting uh, example in his in his book on growth and form, where he noticed that if you just deform uh, certain animal shapes placed on a grid, you apply specific deformations to the grid, what you get are other other species that do exist. Now, at the time, there was no molecular um, uh, mechanism, of course, known. There was not, nothing really, you know, really known about this. But I think, I think now we can we can we can do some some very interesting things with this idea. So, uh, navigating these spaces, changing your body shape to move from one region to another is not uh, trivial because there may be local minima, there may be barriers, there may be all kinds of things. So that that's the task that we face as as uh, as morphogenetic agents. Now, embryogenesis is, is very good at this. They're they're ex it's extremely reliable. So you start off in uh, as as this you know as this kind of pattern, and eventually you end up here, and that's that's generally very low very low error. Um, but we can already see actually that that this process is not simply a kind of pre-programmed hardwired walk in morphous space because we can deviate in the in the middle so for example we can take this nice uh human embryo divide it in half literally cut it in half and what you get are not two half organisms you get two perfectly normal monozygotic twins this, this is where twins come from and so this is a regenerative event where each saw each half of this embryo basically realizes that it's actually not where it's supposed to be in morphous space uh, and uh and it needs to regenerate the other half in order to make the correct changes to get to its goal and where it needs to go so this is not just embryonic uh for example back to this this um the salamander this um this axolotl um, these guys regenerate their limbs, their eyes, their jaws, their spinal cords, uh, portions of their heart and brain, um, their ovaries. They're incredibly regenerative uh, as adults. And what happens is that uh, you can amputate, uh, for example, this limb at different positions. No matter where you cut, the cells will very quickly grow. They will grow exactly what's needed to make a normal axolotl limb, and then they stop. So this is a kind of example of anatomical homeostasis. They will continue working from wherever starting position until they get to the uh, until they get to where they're going uh, parenthetically this is not just for for, for um for frogs and uh, for you know axolotls and, and worms um the human liver of course is regenerative even the ancient greeks knew that i have no idea how they knew that but but it seems like they did um deer uh every year regenerate massive amounts of of bone up to a centimeter and a half of new bone per day uh bone vasculature innervation skin and um, even human children uh, below a certain age can regenerate their fingertips. If you just leave it alone, it'll basically regrow cosmetically a very, very nice um, outcome. So we have, we have some, some ability to, uh, to, to improve our, our position in, in morphous space. One of the most amazing things about it is that as, as, a, as a body, as a, as a living creature, you can't count on your environment. You can't count on, in other words, you can't count on the environment being the same as it was before. You can't count on not being perturbed during the developmental process, maybe physiologically, maybe metabolically, maybe um, with a parasite or a teratogen. So you can't count on that, and you still need to get your job done. In fact, you can't even count on your own parts being what you expected them to be. Now, uh, we, of course, uh, we, we don't have any machines that can do this, that can, that can repair themselves after damage or put themselves together with diverse parts. Here, this is this is one of my uh, favorite examples of all time. This is a, a cross section through a newt um, uh, kidney tubule. So, so here's the lumen of the tubule, and these are, these are the cells that make up the tubule. Normally, it's uh, let's say around eight cells that work together to form this kind of tubule. But one thing you can do is you can you can make uh, you can uh, make these cells what's called polyploid, which means they have extra uh, genetic material. Amazing thing number one with the ex excess genetic material, you still get a perfectly normal newt, no problem that there are all kinds of extra um, in information around, no, 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 no problem. But what does happen is that the cells get much bigger. And as the cells get physically bigger, fewer of them are needed to make the exact same shape lumen. Now, that's, that, that, that's amazing thing number two, is that these cells, the number of these cells will actually scale to their correct size so that you, all, you get the same out, final outcome with different numbers of cells. But the most amazing thing is that when you make these cells absolutely gigantic so that only one cell is big enough to make the whole lumen, what it will do is it will no longer cooperate with other cells. One cell will bend around itself, making uh, the, the exact same lumen. Okay? Now, the incredible thing about that is this is a different molecular mechanism. This was cell-to-cell -cell communication. This is cytoskeletal bending. And so what happens is that this is a kind of, uh, of top-down <clears throat> kind of top causation. 
where in service of a large scale anatomical spec, meaning having the correct lumen, you can call up different molecular mechanisms to get the job done. So this again, is sticking with this, this theme of intelligence as the ability to uh, uh, handle novelty in terms of getting to where you're going from diverse starting positions, uh, with perturbations, both external and internal, you know, your own parts are getting, are changing. Can you still do what you need to do? And all of this is, is described in, in, in some of these papers. Uh, and then, and then the final thing is that your, your walk through morphous space doesn't even have to be the same path. So here, for example, here's a, here's a frog. Frogs normally do not regenerate their legs. As I'll tell you momentarily, we have figured out a way to make them regenerate their legs. And when they do, so this is a pretty good uh, frog leg regeneration. You can see here, it's got the, it's got the toes, the toenails, the webbing. I mean, everything's good. But in fact, the way it got here is not at all how frogs normally regenerate their limbs. Uh, the normally develop their limbs. So normal frog limb morphogenesis is here. You make these things and then you sort of make that, uh, you, you kill off the cells in the middle to make the, pa the paddle. This is, this grows in a completely different way. You've got the, you've got the middle, this kind of middle stalk here with a toenail and then the toes sort of come off to the side. It looks much more like a plant. So it, it takes a different path through morphous space, but it ends up in the same place. So all of this, all of this is, is, uh, is, is back to illustrating some of these amazing uh, abilities of, of these cells to, um, uh, to, 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 to navigate. And so one very kind of, uh, very, very uh, canonical example of this that we discovered a few years ago is, is this. So here's a tadpole, here's the gut, the brain, the nostrils, and the eyes here. This tadpole needs to become a frog. In order to, for a tadpole face to be a frog face, things have to move. So the jaws have to move, the eyes have to move forward, the, um, everything has to move. And it used to be thought that this process was hardwired because if you're a standard tadpole and you want to be a standard frog, all you have to remember is which direction and by how much every piece of the face moves. What we did to, and, and, and we suspected that there was more intelligence to this process than that. And so we did an experiment. We, we created so-called Picasso frogs. And so these are tadpoles in which everything is messed up. The eyes on the side of the head, the jaws are off to the side, and the nostrils are, are too far back. I mean, everything is in the wrong position. And we found that these animals still largely make pretty normal frogs because all of these pieces will move in novel paths. In fact, sometimes they go too far and have to double back to give you a normal frog face. So what the genetics gives you is not some hardwired system that always moves in the same way. What it specifies is a really interesting error minimization machine that uh, however you start it off with obviously with some limits, uh, we'll try to minimize the error and get to the correct final shape. Now, if we had a robotic swarm, uh, a collection of robots that was able to do this, we would we would call this a prize-winning example of collective intelligence. We, we don't have such a such a technology yet. So, uh, so, so we we started trying to understand this process. How how does all this work? And so, to this standard feed forward kind of open loop process of developmental biology that that you that you would read about in in in, um, in class where there are genes they make proteins there's the, the, the some uh, the proteins interact via some physics and chemistry and then there's this emergent outcome we add to this these feedback loops whereby this is actually a homeostatic system if that if that uh, anatomy is disrupted in some way by injury by by um by injury, by mutations, by uh, teratogens, by parasites, whatever, then these feedback loops will kick in to try to minimize error. The cells will do what they can to try to get back to the correct shape. It's a thing, a thing about your thermostat. It's a basic homeostatic circuit. Now, on the one hand, this is uh, pretty, pretty expected. Biologists know all about feedback loops um, and, and so on. On the other hand, there's, there, are, there are two kinds of weird, weird uh, and unusual things here. The first is that every homeostatic process has to have a set point. So if you're going to try to uh, get back to uh, uh, wh where you need to be, you have to remember where the right, uh, the, where the right position is. So you have to store a set point. We're used to thinking about scalars, single numbers as set points, so temperature, pH, things like that. Uh, but in this case, the set point is a, some sort of a large scale uh, uh, geometry. It's a, it's a descriptor of uh, some, some kind of coarse grain descriptor of an anatomy. So it's a complex data structure. And in general, you know, biologists don't love to think about uh, goal-directed processes. The idea is there's supposed to be emergence and, and uh, kind of emergent uh, complexity. But this idea that things are working towards a goal, the way that any navigational system fundamentally does, is really not something that is, uh, is very comfortable, certainly for, for molecular biology. So how would something like this, how would something like this work? How could we have a navigating uh, system that, that uh, can, uh, can have goals in anatomical space. Uh, 